Understanding your religion, the seven major doctrines that define Christianity. This is lesson number five in the series. And uh, we're talking about the doctrine of inspiration. That's the first major doctrine. And we've spent a couple of uh, sessions talking about the first great doctrine, which is the doctrine of inspiration of the Bible. And this is actually the fourth part. And uh, it is entitled, Six Proofs of Inspiration. Okay, so so far in our series on the great, you know, on great Christian doctrine, we've looked at the first of these doctrines, which is the inspiration of the Bible, and in doing so, we have reviewed a couple of things. First of all, we've looked at the history of writing. We've also examined the history of bookmaking. Let's face it, the Bible is a book, and so if we're going to examine it and you know, look at its history, we've got to take a look at you know, how books were made, because it is a book after all how the Old Testament and the New Testaments were compiled, how they were divided, all of this you know, serves our understanding of uh, the Bible itself and how it came to be. Uh, and then we began to review the reasons why we claim it is inspired. So proving the inspiration of the Bible is, uh, is a lot like a court case. Okay? Uh, there's evidence that leads you to a conclusion. So when, you're, when we're talking about uh, inspiration of the Bible, think that you were you know, watching a court case and uh, you know, the prosecution or one of the lawyers brings up all of the proofs and all of the evidence leading you, the jury, to make a particular um, conclusion. And so in this, you know, in this frame of mind, in this type of presentation, we said that the first piece of evidence was a confession. The book itself acknowledge, acknowledges that it is inspired. So, if, so you know, we say six proofs. Well, the first proof, the Bible itself claims that it is inspired. So there's no need to, gain, uh, to guess what the issue is. The Bible states it in no uncertain terms. It is a book inspired by God Himself. Now, the next set of evidences support this basic contention to a point where a person can you know, look at the evidence and conclude that the Bible is indeed from God and not merely a human production. Because that's usually the argument, right? The counter argument is that there's nothing special about the Bible. Oh yeah, it's a beautiful book and a lot of poetry and there's a lot of wisdom in it, but it's just a book. It's just a book produced by men like other books, like other holy books. We as Christians contend, no, it is a book all right, but it is a supernatural book. It is a book that has been inspired by God. So the second, first evidence, that's what it says about itself. Second evidence. Second evidence is the history of the Bible itself. A strong indicator that this is no ordinary book, that it is indeed supernatural in character, is its ability to survive violent attack and close scrutiny without being destroyed or discredited. You know, you, you're watching a Superman movie and Superman, you know, somebody's got a machine gun you know, 20 feet from Superman and, you know, and shoots Superman and it, the bullets bounce off of Superman. What will your conclusion be? Well, your conclusion will be, wow, this guy in the red cape and the funny leotards, you know, he must be super, he must be a superman, right? Because you're watching what happens. Well, in the same way, the Bible has been under attack for centuries, and all attacks against it have failed. So you're kind of coming to the conclusion, there's got to be, you know, they're trying to discredit it from being inspired and never succeed. So that leads you to you know, a certain conclusion that, wow, if they can't destroy it, if they can't deny the claim, if they can't undermine that claim, maybe that claim is true. So what attacks? Well, of course, the attack by the Roman Empire. From 249 AD to 305, it was a capital offense to be in possession of any portion of Scripture. Uh, that's you know, a side note, that's one of the reasons why copies from this period were very small, uh, because they were easier to hide. Uh, by the fourth century, Constantine, the emperor of Rome, permitted and actually paid for copies of the Bible to be made. And so 
the Bible survived the most powerful empire in history that was bent on destroying not only the religion but also the literature of that religion, but failed to do so. Mighty Rome could not destroy the scripture. There was also the attack by the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages. Now, I'm not saying a direct attack here. Uh, I'm saying that uh, the actions of the Catholic Church in the Middle Ages uh, undermined the scriptures to a great degree. Uh, the Roman Church tried to keep people from actually reading the Bible or possessing it because they felt it was too dangerous. And we think, oh my, that sort of thinking you know, is in the Middle Ages. But growing up in Catholic Quebec, as a kid, the 50s and 60s, I can tell you that that attitude was alive and well when I was growing up. You know, I mean, in, even in my own family, you know, when I began to read the Bible and quote it and you know, talk about the Bible, it was like, oh man, you're, you're playing with fire. You're not smart enough to understand that. You know, you'll, I remember a headline in the major newspaper in Montreal, I mean, three and a half million people, that's a big city, big city newspaper, I mean, splashed across the headline, it was, Man kills wife and self after reading Bible. <laughs> I mean, talk about reinforcing this, this stereotype that the scriptures were dangerous for the common man uh, to have. Growing up in Catholic Quebec, again, I speak simply from experience, it's not an attack or anything, I just, I, you know, you grow up in Catholic Quebec, this, these are your experiences. We never, I, you know, I used to go to church when I was a kid, you know, Catholic church. We never studied the Bible, ever, never even opened it. I worked as a teacher, a form teacher for the Montreal Catholic School Commission when I was uh, much younger. And uh, I taught, as a form teacher, I taught all the subjects, you know, math, English, geography, you know, taught fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, that type of thing. I also taught religion. Now imagine, I was teaching religion the Christian religion, to my classes, and I had never, ever opened the Bible. I had never read it, and yet, you know, I had my syllabus and I had my teacher's guide you know, as to what to do and so on and so forth. So the idea of undermining the, the individuals and encouraging them to read the Bible, this was just not something that was done. Um, Bibles at the time, let's go back to the Middle Ages, Bible uh, at the time were uh, you know, chained to the pulpit, so no one could take them. Also because they were very valuable, you know, it was very expensive to create a Bible in those days. By the 16th century, uh, King James paid for a translation and a distribution of the Bible in the common language, and this is what broke the monopoly and got the Bible into the hands of the people. The Bible survived, I would say, the repression of the most powerful religious organizations in the Middle Ages. Couldn't keep it down. Generations of people were not permitted or couldn't read the Bible and yet it continued to survive. And then of course, attack by philosophers, skeptics, critics. In the 17th to 19th century, writers and thinkers in Europe began to question the Bible's inspiration and its authority. They developed godless ideas about where man originated and how he should live without reference to God. One of these, Voltaire, a brilliant French philosopher, said the following, and I quote, it took 12 ignorant fishermen to establish Christianity and one Frenchman to destroy it. And he spent his life undermining and attacking the scripture. His personal crusade was to discredit the Bible as uninspired and to draw people away from using it as their guide for life. Interesting fact, 25 years after Voltaire's death, his home was purchased by the Geneva Bible Society and used as a warehouse to distribute Bibles. So a little, you know, little payback there. If we look at the history of the Bible, we see that it has survived military, religious, and philosophical attacks for over 2,000 years, and yet it continues to be the most printed, most translated, most read book in the world and in all of history. Of course, and here's the point, you would expect this from a book that says of itself that it is from God. You would expect no less from a book that says it is inspired. 
All right, evidence number uh, three, or proof number three if you wish, is the uniqueness of the Bible. Whenever scholars examine religious books, they always discover flaws, mistakes, the inability of the teachings to apply to all people or to adapt to changing times. You know, one of the reasons why many religions like Shinto, the ancient religion of Japan, for example, or Zoroastrianism, uh, why these religions die out is because their teachings become irrelevant. They just can't adapt to modern society. Um, the Muslims, for example, protect themselves against this because they say that the Quran was actually written by God in, um, in um, a special language and non-Muslims cannot touch it or understand it properly. So if, you've got, if, if that's how you set up your thing, you know, you're, you're guarding yourself against any type of outside criticism. No one on the outside who's a non-Muslim can understand the Quran. You can't touch it. So you, know, you can criticize it all you want, but you just don't understand it because it was written by God. However, many scholars who have studied it agree that the Muslim religion has many inconsistency and without changes it can't survive or be adapted to Western countries. I know that all you hear about is, you know, uh, Islam on TV, uh, you know, terrorism and the, the politics and how to deal with uh, countries that have this as their main religion. But did you note what the problem is? Within the same religion, the problem is you have individuals that want to take the nations back to the, like, the ninth century or the 12th century you know, in their customs and, and in the way they adapt the religion to society. And then you have another side that's you know, trying to bring it into the you know, modern age and can't succeed. You don't have that problem with Christianity. The Bible has been translated and examined and re-examined by scholars and experts in each century and they come to similar conclusions about the uniqueness of the Bible. Even if you have a scholar that refuses to accept that it is inspired, let's just say, one thing they do agree on, it is unique. It's not like any other book. For example, it is unique in its uh, depths of insight and its beauty. Uh, Dr. George White from Harvard University says that in comparison with other holy books in modern and ancient times, the Bible is in a class by itself. There is no comparable book or class of writings. And, and, and this individual, this scholar, is not a, he's not a Christian. He's not a, he's not a, you know, a Bible you know, professing type of individual. He's a scholar in literature, ancient literature. He just said, there's nothing to compare to it. It is deep enough for the most learned scholar and simple enough for a child to grasp. And don't we understand that? Here we have you know, adults, and as I look around, very experienced adults in the study of scripture. You know, you, this class kind of knows the Bible. And yet, down the hall, we have uh, you know, uh, Debbie Kessler's little kids class. You know, and what are they studying? Well, they're studying the same book. And a lot of times we're studying the same, the same book in the Bible. We're studying Genesis in here, for example, and they're studying Genesis in there. Deep enough to keep advanced learners occupied and challenged, simple enough for little kids. Uh, to, to learn. Not, not a lot of books are like that. Uh, it's unique in its unity. Think now. 66 books written over a period of 1400 years. 40 different authors writing at different times, different places, different cultures. Most of them, most of the writers not knowing each other you have some overlap in the prophets there, but most of the writers not knowing each other, not able to collaborate, if you wish, and yet the entire book tells only one story without contradiction, confusion, or disorder. I mean, we couldn't do that today. Even when you have a committee writing a report, <laughs> just, you know, a 20-page report on something, I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's as if only one person wrote it 
And if you're a Bible reader, you know, if, if that's one of your habits that you've cultivated, that every day you read the Bible, some days for five or 10 minutes, some days for 20 minutes, depending on your schedule. And if you've made that a, a life habit and you just do that, you know, I read through the Bible, and I've said before, not during the daytime when I'm you know, working on stuff. I mean, just my own time, my private time, like everybody else, I read the Bible. I don't read it to make a lesson or anything. I just read it to read it, to let it talk to me. And I start in Genesis and I go all the way to Revelation. When I'm finished, I go back to Genesis, except I take a different translation. One time I'll read the King James, then when I have read the King James, I'll read the New American Standard, and then I'll read the New Revised Standard, then I'll read the New Living, the New Living Bible, and the Good News for Modern Man, blah, blah. You know, I'll read different versions. I don't know how many of the versions that I read, and I keep reading it over and over again. And this point comes to me all the time. It's as if the same person is writing. You know, the, the, thread, the, the thread is never broken from one book to the other, all the way to the all the way to the end. And of course, it's unique in its universality. It is the most read, most translated, most sold book in the history of the world, without exception. I mean, I know Harry Potter you know, was big, <laughs> but it's not this big. There are still, on top of that, there are still over 5,000 copies of original manuscripts and copies that exist. No other ancient book has this many in circulation that are this old. So it has universal appeal for over 1900 years. So here's my point with this you know, unique, uniqueness of the Bible. No other book can claim as many readers in as many countries, in as many languages, for as many years. No other book has been so studied and found to be so unique in style and content and unity. What's the point? Well, wouldn't you expect that from a book that was written by God? I would accept, I would accept no less. If this is a work done by God, then it ought to be unique in insight and beauty. If I can find better insights in another book, you see what I'm saying? Well, maybe I should go with that other book, but I, I haven't. It's adaptability. Uh, uh, I haven't traveled that much, but the little traveling that I've done outside, you know, outside of Canada or outside of the United States, uh, I go to another country. Um, you know, I've been to Haiti, for example, a very different culture, and I've been to church where they have the Bible and they speak Creole and they have a whole different environment, and yet, when we begin talking about the Bible, it's as if I'm talking to somebody who grew up in my own, my own city. We, we find a common place to meet when one believer is talking to another believer about the scripture. The commonality, the universality of it, it's amazing. All right, evidence number four. Ever, evidence number four is that it works. Kind of a modern pragmatic argument. This is modern man's criteria. Something is true or good because it works, right? But you cannot deny the fact that the principles contained in the Bible do work to produce happy and peaceful lives. No other philosophy or lifestyle or religious uh, idea works better. And all you have to do is examine the countries that don't have Christianity as their base and compare them to countries that do. Okay? The country, or this country rather, and I, you know, we've said, both Marty and I have said this from the pulpit, this country prospered when it was functioning under the Christian principles that were found in the Bible, and it has begun to falter as the nation has moved away from these things. Now you would expect that God's manual for life would lead to a superior life for a person or for a nation that follows it. So simply compare any person or nation not following the Bible and it'll be plain to see that God's plan for life is in the Bible, nowhere else. Well, is there a better attitude than love your neighbor? <laughs> Is there a faster way to heal relationships than to love your enemy, to forgive one another, to tell the truth, 
to put God first, to trust in Him. You know, is there a better philosophy of life? I, I haven't seen it. There are countries that are more, quote, zealous in their religion, but you might be zealous for a wrong idea. You, know? you might be more zealous for your wrong idea than I am for the right idea, but the right idea always has better fruit, always. Evidence number five, historical act, uh, exactitude. So if a book is inspired, it has to be accurate because you know, God doesn't make mistakes. And of course, this is where skeptics attack the scriptures all the time, always trying to find some sort of error. But we have learned over the years that archeology, span for example, supports the historical accuracy of the Bible. We know that uh, archeology, span you know, it's the study of people and customs and life in ancient times. And how do they do this? They do this by digging up and studying the remains of ancient cities and villages, temples, so on and so forth. And they kind of piece together the culture of that period. Now, whenever archeologists discover a city or a people mentioned in the Bible, everything they find out in their discovery is in harmony with what the Bible describes about those people. Okay? Actually, archeologists use the Bible as a reference guide to search many of the ancient places. They actually start with the Bible and the Bible mentions ancient cities and they try to kind of find where those cities are. It gives them a point of reference as to where to start digging and when they start digging and discover what they're looking for, they realize that the scriptures have accurately described that place and that time. Uh, in Joshua uh, chapter 3 verse 10, Joshua mentions the Hittite, the Hittites. Uh, but for a long time, archeologists could not find any trace of this nation. And this was a basis for their rejection of Bible accuracy. In other words, the skeptics would say, yeah, yeah, but in the Bible it mentions the Hittites. And for centuries, we've looked for the Hittites, not found them, therefore the Bible must be incorrect. But then, in 1872, they discovered Hittite writings, actually an entire library, which confirmed their existence and the accuracy of the Bible. So the people, you know, for hundreds of years, this was, a, this was a, a problem that was unanswered. And probably the preachers of the time would have to say, you will perhaps have to take, based on faith, that the Bible is accurate about the Hittites because the archeologists have not found it. So for hundreds of years, that was the case up until 1872. And then you didn't have to take it by faith anymore you had proof that was provided. Sometimes historians find out that their discoveries don't contradict the Bible, they simply don't have all the pieces of the puzzle. For example, Isaiah chapter 20 verse one, Isaiah mentions Sargon, one of the kings. Now his name, this name Sargon, was not in any of the historical record of the kings at that time, according to researchers, but recent discoveries have shown that this king borrowed his name and this fact was only recorded in the Bible, not in the records of the time. So I'm just kind of giving you a couple of examples of how uh, the scriptures establish a historical fact, but researchers catch up, if you wish, with their discoveries to match the two. The key idea of this historical evidence is that if the Bible has been shown to be accurate in obscure historical facts, is it not logical to trust its accuracies in matters uh, that are more important as well? You know, faithful in little things, faithful in big things. You know, men have tried to undermine its accuracy for centuries, they've always failed. So you would expect this kind of razor sharp accuracy from a book written by God. I mean, wouldn't you do that? I mean, if it's from God, there are no mistakes. The mistakes on our, are on our part. We don't understand, we don't have all the physical evidence. And then evidence number six, or proof, don't forget now, this is a court case. You know, all the pieces of evidence are laid before you. So evidence number six, or proof number six, fulfilled prophecy. We know that men, human beings, cannot predict accurately future events. We study trends. We can make predictions based on those trends and we can hope to have a percent 
of success. Right? Nobody expects anybody to be 100% accurate in you know, uh, not foretelling, but you know, predicting, if you wish, whether it's the weather or the stock market, who's going to win the Super Bowl, you know, whatever. We, you know, it's odds, right? The odds are there. But only God can be 100% accurate in predicting future events. So in the Bible, there are predictions or prophecies of events in the lives of people and nations that would take place either days or years or centuries into the future. One of these is in Isaiah 44, 28. God is speaking and says, It is I who says of Cyrus, he is my shepherd, and he will perform all my desire. And he declares of Jerusalem, she will be built, and of the temple your foundation will be laid. Okay, so yeah, you're going, okay, big deal. We know that that happened. After the destruction, you know, the, the, the city was rebuilt, the temple was rebuilt. But here's the thing. Isaiah lived in 700 BC. Cyrus, the one being mentioned here, was a king, but he only ruled 150 years after Isaiah. See what I'm saying? And so in Isaiah you have the prophet who names him, gives his position, and explains what he would eventually do. It's like me giving the name of the President of the United States in a hundred years from now, and even telling you which party that President will be, will be in. It'll be a Clinton, but you know, we're not sure. <laughs> Clinton or Bush, yeah, in a hundred years. So. so here's my point on this. There are hundreds of such prophecies in the Old Testament and of these, 61 deal specifically with Jesus. So in the Old Testament, you have prophecies that tell you which you know, lineage He will come through in Jeremiah 23.5. Other prophecies, the time when He will appear, Daniel, you know, uh, Daniel gives us which kingdoms are going to come in the future and then during this kingdom, he says, during this uh, kingdom, uh, the, the Messiah will appear. Uh, the place he was going to be born, Micah chapter 5 verse 2. His titles and his power, Isaiah 9 verses 6 and 7. And what is so amazing is his character, the reason why he would come, how he would die, Isaiah 42 to 52, you know, the suffering servant passages. All done, hundreds of years. So how is fulfilled prophecy and evidence that the Bible is from God? Well, accurate fulfillment of a prophecy is a sign that a supernatural power is at work. Some have guessed at the future, but no man has produced hundreds of accurately detailed and fulfilled prophecy. Only God can do this. And He has done this within the pages of the Bible. So the Bible, and this is an important point, the Bible is the only holy book, the only one of all the major religions. The Bible is the only holy book that contains a record of fulfilled prophecy. Nobody, no other religion has this feature in their religion. No other religion has their prophet, their leader, their whoever, their guru or anything like that has you know, they're made a prophecy for the future. Never mind one or two, how about hundreds of them that are fulfilled? No other religion has that. So there are a lot of holy books and writings by pious men and pious women, but only the Bible has a record of both prophecies made and their fulfillment hundreds of years later, and all confirmed by history. We know Jesus was born in Bethlehem. We know Jesus lived. We know He died on the earth. This is all historical record. We know this. This is not like imagining. I mean, Josephus, the historian of the Jews who lived at the time of Jesus, who was not a Christian actually, he writes about this Jesus, this insurrectionist. They found records. Pilate, some of his records. You know, I mean, he was just one of many who was crucified. So 
history confirms the fulfillment of prophecies that were made in the Old, in the Old Testament. We know that Isaiah did live. We know for a fact that he did live and he wrote in the seventh century. We know that Cyrus lived and he reigned and he kept the Jews captive in the sixth. So if the Bible is from God, wouldn't you expect that it contained features not possible by humans and only from God, features such as fulfilled prophecy? Human beings can write wisdom books and you know, beautiful, beautiful books of poetry, or even books that exalt the name of God and so on and so forth, you know? but no human being can make hundreds of predictions and then record in the same book. You know, in, in, at the beginning you get the prophecies and then at the end you get all the fulfillments and it's all in the same book. 66 books, 40 writers, 1400 years worth of time going by. I mean, you know, we, it couldn't be engineered. You couldn't, you couldn't, you know, you couldn't, you can't massage this stuff. So let's kind of you know, summarize here, put it kind of together. We've laid out the evidence before you concerning the Bible. First of all, it says that it is inspired by God. Second evidence, it has survived 2,000 years of criticism, scrutiny, and attack. And by the way, something that no other book has ever. I mean, if, if, you, <laughs> if you take a copy of the Koran and publicly burn it, you're on a hit list. <laughs> If you publicly you know, state, if you're in a Muslim country, here you can do it because we have freedom of speech, thanks be to God. So yeah, so far. Uh, but if you're in a Muslim country and you stand up publicly and you criticize, you know, if you say, well, wait a minute, the, you know, the Quran says this over here and then it contradicts itself and it says this over there, there's a mistake here or there's a historical accuracy. You know, that's, that's a wonderful way to keep criticism down. No one has ever done that for the scriptures. Oh, there was a time in the Middle Ages you know, where the Catholic Church had inordinate political power, tried to keep down. You know, somebody translates the Bible into a common language, what's their reward? Jail. But the scriptures survived nevertheless. Number three, it has been found to be unique among all writings in every area. It is unique in psychology, uh, emotionally, theologically, historically, socially. It is a unique piece of work. Number four, it has changed the lives of individuals and nations. We don't have to go to nations. We just look around in this room and get, get, you know, pick people to stand up and give their testimony. How has God's word affected you? Well, it changed my life. I had a completely different life before I began actually reading the Bible as an adult. And I think I've shared with you in the past, the one great advantage of becoming a Christian when you're 30 or 31 or you know, as, a, as an adult is that you can remember clearly what it was like when you were not a Christian. And you remember clearly what it felt like not to be a believer, not to understand the truth, not to have that hope. You know, you remember what that was like. So my life changed, I mean, 180 degrees since, and, and, and some people say to me, well, you were Catholic, what's the best way to help a Catholic you know, understand God and come to faith and so on and so forth? And I said, read the Bible, that's what I did. I sat on a train for three days and I read the Bible because I couldn't afford to buy another book. I was so broke, so I was five bucks a Bible. I figured that'll keep me busy for a couple of days. <laughs> So 37 years later, <laughs> oh dear. So it has a tremendous impact on a, on a nation. Um, proof number five, it is exact in all its details. And number six, it contains fulfilled prophecy, a phenomenon not duplicated by man. So what conclusion do we come to in the face of such evidence? Well, the conclusion that I present to you is that mere men or a group of people uh, uh, cannot have just written this book. And, and if it, it, for the people who say it was written by men, my answer is, well, if that's true, why have men never been able to duplicate or improve or destroy this book? 
We've improved, duplicated, or destroyed everything else, but we haven't managed to improve the Bible, have we? The only other conclusion is to believe what it says. Remember the first proof? It says it is inspired. That's the only conclusion. That it is truly a book from God and the evidence is sufficient to support this. You know, God does not overwhelm us with evidence. You know, we don't each get a personal miracle and a personal, that's what the Jews wanted. Show us a sign, they said, do something. And he had done miracles, but the miracles that he did, you know, raising the dead, healing the blind men, they were not good enough for them. When they said, show us a miracle, they wanted a miracle like Moses, you know, stop the sun in the sky, or you know, send manna from heaven, or you know, a miracle like that, you know, divide the sea, you know, get, Never mind that raising from the dead, you know, that's kid stuff, you know, amateur hour, you know, give us a real miracle. Well, some people are like that when it comes to the Bible. They want a personal miracle, and that's not the way it works. God gives us sufficient evidence and proof so that we can exercise our willpower. Okay? So if we accept this, then there are several things that are required of us. If the Bible is inspired, so let's not just study or read it, but let's understand that it is God who speaks to us and we can know Him through His word. That's what I love about the Bible. When I learn something about the scripture, I have that thing forever. You know that Jesus is the Son of God, uh, many passages that point to that idea, that Jesus is the Son of God, that truth will never change. That those who come to Him you know, in faith and repentance and baptism you know, uh, receive the forgiveness of their sins, that will never change. Somebody says to me, how do you know your sins are forgiven? I, I never answer, well, I, I feel better. Or, no, 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 no. I just go, I open up to Acts 2, 38, and it says right here where it says, repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Acts 2, 38, I did that. So when I'm feeling guilty or down on myself because I'm not doing real well, you know what I'm saying? I, you, know, I, you ever say to yourself, oh, you're a bad person, Michael. You're just a bad person. What you just said, what you just did, that was bad. That was, you know, when I have those moments, I go back to Acts 2.38 and say, oh yeah, I remember now. Why? Because it's God's word, it's His promise, it's in stone, it'll never, never change. Secondly, Let's do what it says. Don't just hear it, put it into practice because it's God Himself who's calling us to be whatever it is, baptized, to live pure lives, to love our neighbors, be ready for it, whatever, whatever He says, that's Him talking to us. And then thirdly, don't be afraid. The world will not believe. The world will try to destroy the word, but it is the rock upon which our faith is built. And the Bible says, no storm will wash us away if we stay on this rock, Matthew 7, verse uh, 21. So the first and foremost Christian doctrine is the inspiration of the Bible, that's number one. If this is not true, then the rest of the teaching that comes from it can be in question. But if it is true, then we are bound to study and do what it says and certainly not be afraid. And of course, the fact that we, this is the basis, the basic doctrine, this is why this one is attacked so vehemently. If they can destroy this one, all the rest fall. All right, so next time we're going to talk about the divinity of Christ. That's the second major doctrine. All right, that's it for now. Thank you.